So hello, how are you? Orgasmic <laughs> in this rain. It's been raining in LA like crazy. It's pouring here. It's been pouring yeah. for the past. Yeah, we had like one day of sunshine and then it got bad again. But so I found you on TikTok. I absolutely, your videos absolutely crack me up. I think I've done a couple of duets to them. They're Love just it. so refreshing, so honest and just like, you you kind of leave the video going, did she just say that? <laughs> did that did I just hear that? And it's hilarious. So thank you. Thank just you. Please introduce yourself to my guests and and of course um we'll tell them where they can find you at the end, but tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. Um, in a condensed version. Hello everyone. My name is Dr. Tara. Um I have I wear three hats. First hat is I am a tenured professor of sexuality at Cal State University Fullerton. My second hat is a coach. I have a private practice here in Los Angeles where I see um, clients, couples, individuals helping them with their sexual goals. And then my third hat is content creator, Love Bites by Dr. Tara. I have my podcast. I have my Instagram, TikTok. My TikTok is the liveliest one <laughs> with uh, very active participants, I would say, very active <laughs> followers. Yes. What you post is is much, much needed. So I want to ask you what your kind of what your typical client looks like. And then I actually wrote my, a lot of my followers are, are men. I'd say about, you know, 90, 80% of them, just depending on what platform you're on. And um, so they had some questions for you and we'll, we'll get into those, but first just kind of tell me like, what is, what is your typical client? Yes. So my typical clients are 50-50, 50% couples, 50% men, mm -hmm. individuals. So the couples are in there working with me with a specific sex issue, communication issue, um, or a certain sex thing that they want to achieve and they don't know how to go about starting. Mm -hmm. um, with individuals, it, it's all over the place. Um, some of them are single. And kind of just want to like up their riz, like up their flirting style and like how to basically um, attract the right women. Mm -hmm. um, and then others are in a relationship and kind of want to work on their own sexual competence uh, in order to appeal more to their current partner. Awesome. Yes. I think that that's something that we should all be talking about. And I did watch a TED talk that you had on your website, I believe. And, you know, as far as the sexual suppression and the oppression, do you feel that that is a, a thing in the Western culture or just a thing in general everywhere? Yeah. I mean, historically speaking, and I've been writing about this a lot because this past year I published my textbook. I have two other co-authors, but uh, we did a lot of research about like the history of sex and a lot of a lot of writing about it. I learned that, you know, sexual shame has always been here for the longest time. Historically, for the contemporary history, we've always seen sex as a taboo. Mm -hmm. uh, but long, long time ago, it wasn't. Right. So there's like ancient history where it wasn't a taboo and then it became a taboo. And now people like us are trying to make it less of a taboo and more of a something that's normal to talk about. Uh, but I think sexual suppression, oppression or whatever uh, still very much exist uh, in the Western world, depending on where you are. Uh, I'm in Los Angeles. It's a lot more sexually open and sexually mm -hmm. liberal. People talk about sex. There's sex shops everywhere. Um, but there are cities or towns um, in America that, you know, it's still very, very much a taboo. So I can't say that America is sexually liberal because not everywhere is. Yeah, I was lucky. I was, my mom, all my friends used to go over to her house because she was the one that talked about sex. Uh, so, you know, all my friends would come over and ask her advice. And she she grew up in a Caribbean town. She grew up in oh. King, she grew up in Jamaica and in Kingston. And she always said, she's Cuban. And uh, long story there, but she always said, you know, Sarah, I don't want you to be like how I was, where I was just finding out about sex when I when I 
first had sex, you know, when I was 20 years old, because we were, you know, raised very Catholic, you know, it's very Latina, very Latino family. Like you don't talk about it. You just have babies and don't have, you know, don't get on birth control. And my mom really, I was very thankful that she was like, here's she, you know, I think I, I think I accidentally found um, you know, a massager. They didn't have, you know, the, the, the types of uh, instruments that we have yeah. now for women. So I like pulled up with her drawer one time and it was the back massager. And I'm like, mom, what's this? And she just she's like launched. She's like, let me tell you the ways, my friend. Oh my gosh. Okay. That's amazing. And yeah. that's not common. No, I wish you can clone your mom. And like, that's the attitude of everyone's moms. I know. It's just not the case. This past summer, I did uh, two focus groups on how Gen Z's grew up, uh, Mm. like how their parents talked about sex. And most of them, their parents are either have like negative sexual attitudes or they just let their kids like figure out on their own. Yeah. And it's like, why would you you know, why would you want them to go somewhere else or just to experiment? I I don't, I'm not a parent, so I have to respect that there's obviously, I think what the idea is, is that if we talk about it too soon or talk about it early and often that they'll want to go do it, but they've actually, you know, Esther Perel, I follow her and have listened to her many times. Yes. I mean, she says actually in other countries where sex is more, you know, prevalent and talked about less oppressed, there's actually less teenagers doing it. So we, we have some work to do on that, but okay. So let me get into some of the questions that my, uh, Instagram friends and my, all my male audience, if you, if you will indulge me. So as far as the effects of porn, I, I had a lot of men ask me about how that is potentially ruining relationships or what, if they're going to watch porn, is there a certain type? Okay. Yeah. I think porn is a big topic when it comes to men's and their viewing behavior. I would Mm -hmm. say there's positive effects and negative effects. We'll Mm -hmm. start with the positive effects. Uh, A potential positive effect of porn is to bring in excitement, fun, um, introduce a new sexual thing for the couple. So for couples that, you know, have been together a long time, tend to have like vanilla sex and they find it more and more boring each day, watching porn together can actually be a really good um, activity to do. Uh, However, that's kind of mainly what I think the positive effects is, apart from like, you know, self-exploration, stuff like that. Now, the negative effects of excessive viewing of porn, uh, the list is pretty long, but the major two that I've seen in research and in professional experience is the first one um, is that they have a very false perception of what sex actually looks like in real life. Mm -hmm. Um, And then, you know, they think that their dick has to be eight inches, super hard, super big, right? (laughs) And then they think like women goes, ah, (laughs) <laughs> like you know like in porn <laughs> they, i do they think penetration is just like oh pull my pants down i get fucking hard and then i just go for it i just penetrate right porn rarely shows like the the tender the like licking the nipples the grabbing the go down like lick her pussy part right it's it all kind of just goes into like penetration and pounding so the first negative effects is young men watching it a lot have false perception of what sex actually is like in real life Mm -hmm. the second big negative effect that i've seen is their performance so there's research that shows watching a lot of porn affects um your penis performance so it can be in a form of erectile dysfunction it can be in a form of premature ejaculation ejaculation it can be in a form of delayed ejaculation or losing Mm -hmm. the erection halfway um there are many different negative effects to excessive viewing of porn. So I'm not a big fan of excessive viewing of porn. I've, and I've actually experienced that myself with a partner, you know, who, who would struggle with actually keeping an interaction. Mm-hmm. Um, so that, you know, and what, and what that did for me was make it really tough. I don't oh, want to yeah. say, I don't want to say hard, but um <laughs> <laughs> not, hard. It, not hard. Um, it it actually really affected 
my self-esteem because oh, then, yeah. then the woman thinks, is there something wrong with me? Is there something that I'm doing that is causing him to lose his erection? And some of the porn is just, it's so up close. And I, 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 it's just, I don't know how your brain could differentiate between the two. So it's, it's really hard for both couples, but for the positive, I, I enjoy it myself. I mean, I think that there's some for, as a woman, if you really, you know, if you're comfortable in your skin, you know, I, I actually like to pick it out myself. I'm like, oh, I have to like the girl or I have, like, yeah. there's like, oh, a, yeah. there's like a, really, a connection. I really like the girl. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, good. That's not just me because there's other women that I know where I'm like, ew, if she's, if she's like too skinny or like, I'm like, I'm, you know, I'm Latina. Yeah. So like, I need to see some skin, some meat on her bones, you know? And then right. I'm like, I'm into it. But I think any suggestions on how men could potentially like introduce the topic or say, Hey, you know, would you like to watch this or, you know, anything that you've seen work? Yeah. So, um, the first thing that I've seen that work with, you know, in a heterosexual couple, like the man introducing porn is actually sending like a certain clip or definitely like do a disclaimer first, like a text, like, Hey babe, saw this, um, and thought we could do this tonight. Right. Mm. And then send the link to whatever that you want to do. Sexting used to be like is seen to be like an easy way to introduce porn um, rather than like sitting next to each other and like turn around and go, do you want to watch porn? Right. Cause yeah. that allows people, the other person to read it and, and process and realize like, Oh yeah, I think I want to participate in this. Or if they don't, they get a chance to like have a reaction and then respond. Mm, so, they can like have their reaction in private too. Like if I'm, yeah, you know, if I'm taken yeah. aback by it. Okay. Yeah, great what suggestion. if like you get a video and it's like the girl's like eating his ass and you're like, girl, I'm not into this. Like, you know, <laughs> then you can have your own reaction and then respond more mindfully. Right. So I think yeah. texting is a good way to introduce like a certain porn that you want to watch. One thing that I want to introduce to, um, I'm sure a lot of people already know this is ethical porn. What does that mean? I know you did a post on that the other day and I wondered what that meant. It's becoming more and more mainstream. Uh, ethical porn is porn that's made in, um, well, I guess in an ethical manner. Mm -hmm. uh, all of the actors are there. They're enthusiastic to be there. They love working in the industry. They all get paid fairly because originally what like kind of the stereotype uh, in porn is like, you know, women are being used or like they don't get right. paid as much as men uh, or whatever it is. The the actual situation is the ethical porn is just more transparent. Okay. Um, more, there's more communication between the actors. Uh, there's Where do you also, find this? Sorry, keep there going. Are, yeah, there are quite a few sites that are known as ethical porn sites. So like Afterglow is one of them oh. um, that I use and like my clients use, but there are many others. So I don't want to say like I'm advertising, but like I use no, Afterglow, yeah. but you can use whatever. Just Google ethical porn um, because these companies, they they pride themselves to provide uh, the type of porn that's also the second part of ethical porn is it's more realistic. Hmm. And they don't do like fake stunts because, for example, um, I watch a lot of this when I was young. Like traditional porn will do squirting videos and they will have like shootout bottles. Yeah, like, under so, the girls when I see it, it just like makes me, I like giggle. I'm like, okay, my, yeah. I've, lost my fem I've lost my female erection. Like it's gone. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But the thing is, young people, millions of young people watch that and like, I know. Think, and they oh think my God, cool. I got to be able to squirt like that. That's not real. Like that girl girl has to like shoot bottle under her butt and then they shoot out like a huge ejaculate which is not real so a lot of the things that happen in traditional porn are not real and they reinforce like negative stereotypes of people during sex so with that being said ethical porn is trying to combat that and show show real bodies like they have a lot more body diversity they show real angles um, they show real sex, like when, you know, you're eating them out, like they don't show just like skinny angle or, mm -hmm. you know, um, excessive cum or whatever, like everything yeah. real. 
So I'm, gonna, I'm like, I'm going to have to go check this out after we're done. Yeah. Yeah. I personally only watch that because I just want to have, I want to watch like real people have real sex. Yes. Yes. And that, that's, yeah. it, again, I think the woman, right. If we're going to introduce it to our partners and men, if they're going to introduce it to your partners, like it's so important for us to feel yeah. as though it's realistic and that it's not just some trash, you know, for, for me at least, you know, yeah. every, woman, every woman is different, but I think it's, you know, let her pick it out, right. Like mm-hmm. let her lead the process if it's new for her, because if we're not into it, it's just not going to go well for, for anybody. No, 100%. Yeah. Um, so, uh, miss a big, big thing I get from my followers all the time is that they are struggling with the amount of sex drive, you know, in their relationships that they feel mismatched or they feel as though that their woman is not as interested in them or doesn't initiate as much. So I, I'm sure you deal with this with a lot with couples, kids get in the way, you know, relationships are hard to keep that passion alive for a long period of time. So I don't know if there's anything that you can speak to. I personally think women have just as high a sex drive as men do for maybe not as much testosterone that drives that, but I do think women are horny. So, yeah. so what, what's your thoughts on how to keep these things alive? I love that you said that. I do think that women are horny. I'm horny. <laughs> I'm super horny. But <laughs> yeah. I, I would have to say, you know, I learned this from Michaela Boehm. I watch her on Goop and um, I learned this from all of her teachings is the most important thing that long-term couples don't realize that they should be doing is distance. Mm. Yeah. Um, They spend too much time together. They spend all the time talking about chores and necessary things to keep the household up and up and going, but there's not enough space and distance. Mm. for the couple. Um, So distance can bring excitement, can bring novelty, can bring like, oh, I miss you. Um, So the first thing that I want long-term couples to consider when it comes to managing that passion and desire is find a way to create more distance, Mm. physical distance. Um, and of maybe course, one goes on a maybe take trips or somebody goes on a business trip or maybe you're spending like at home. Let's say if you don't do those things, could you be in different rooms or how does that look if you're living in the same space? Yes. So my idea is you do live in the same space, right? Because like, let's say you're married or cohabitating. Um, the first thing is, yeah, take trips. The second thing is like, have your, have your own thing, have girls night. Have boys night, do your own thing, have your own stuff. You know, Mm. don't just always hang out together and not have anything of your own, like your own social group, your own social calendar. So have your own thing is very important. Spend time apart. Um, It doesn't have to be a whole trip. It can just be a night out. Like you can go out with the girls, you can go out with the guys um, and let that be like that distance. Like, oh, I can't wait to go home and eat her pussy or something. (laughs) 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 You know, like keep the distance um, alive. Keep the distance alive. Uh, the second thing about distance is you can also, for example, if you're both like working on the computer, one of you can go work in a coffee shop, right? Don't spend like mm, all the time I together. See. You know, I if see. you're both digital nomad, right? Or entrepreneurs, yep. and you're on your which computer, is so, but which is a lot of us now. Absolutely. A lot of us now. And you are, you see each other all day. You wake up together, make coffee together, sit there and work on your computer together, do dinner together, and then try to have sex. Bro, I've seen you all day. <laughs> mm-hmm. There's no room for me to be like, oh, I'm like, I miss him. I want to kiss him. I really? want to smell him, right? I think distance is so important that long-term couples kind of forget um, to insert in their relationship. The second yeah. thing is how fun is your relationship outside of the bedroom? Mm-hmm. And I call this positive bubbles. Um, I think in a relationship, there's an atmosphere, like the vibe. Um, Are there a lot of negative and tense bubbles in your space? Or are there a lot of positive and bubbly, like bubbly bubbles, like positive and fun bubbles in your space? Of course, there's stress. Like I live in a normal world. I have four jobs. Of course, there's stress, right? Right. But then you want to make sure that every time you're together, there's at least more positive bubbles than negative bubbles. 
Hmm. Right. So, that reminds me of um, kind of that John Gottman, you know, five to one ratio, like positive to negative. It's a different, little bit of a different concept, but yeah, I mean, you want to go here. out and date nights and and have have something to look forward to and yeah. 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 yeah, like how how fun is your relationship in general? And people think, oh, wow, that's just like a privileged thing. That's an expensive thing. It doesn't have mm. to be at all. No. Going on a spontaneous hike is free, mm -hmm. right? Yep. Like uh, going on a spontaneous hike, just spending time alone, not watching TV, just being the two of you in a quiet space, hiking, maybe like, you know, squeezing a little bit, touching a little bit, being a little bit more playful. Um, all of those things are free. Yeah. So it is not like an expensive thing to have fun in your relationship. I mean, you know, dating in LA, dating in Southern California can get very expensive. So yeah. I always appreciate, you know, for me when um, I've had dates that are just on the beach with yeah. a box of crackers and Trader Joe's wine and whatever the guy, you know, whatever he decides to do, it's like, that's, that's fine. It's, that's I think fun. that, yeah, I think guys think it has to be this this production, but it's, that's, that's just the thought that count that it's almost better. The fact that you went and did and all this planned and mm -hmm. you had all the basket and it's, it's like, I don't know I thought that was such a nice gesture because you went out of your way to do things. So I think yeah. it's the little things that I think men need to understand that women aren't looking for, you know, five star steak and lobster dinners every time. Are you currently dating? I am dating mm -hmm. Ooh, with the uh, intention, with very serious intentions. I would like to find a life partner. I love that. Would you like it if the, your date like cooks for you? Oh, absolutely. I mean, vice yeah. both. I mean, vice versa, whatever it is. I yeah. love men that cook. It's It's very sexy. It's so sexy. So my fiance, we're actually getting married this weekend. Oh my gosh. Congrats. <laughs> and you, you like too. squeezed me in last minute. No, I'm, I'm so working. Honored. I'm working. <laughs> but my fiance, actually our first date, he cooked for me. Wow. And I was hooked. I yeah. Was like, uh, yeah. Yeah. That's... Oh, he also got naked. Like he got <laughs> naked and then he cooked. I'm like, you know what you're doing. You know what you're doing. You know, swinging your dick around, like, you know, making pasta. I'm like, uh, feed me with carbs and show me your dick. Oh, did he wear an apron? Was no, it like he was just naked? Oh my god. I loved it. I just thought he was so playful. That's like every element that I want. Acts of service and like playfulness in a relationship. So important. Absolutely. It's so funny. That's so, that's like such a dating in LA story. Yeah. <laughs> Love it. Oh my um, gosh. He's also a, an oil painter. So it's very LA story. Yeah. That's congratulations. That's Thank amazing. You. A lot yeah. of times men will tell me that they have a really hard time getting their woman to climax or, or women in general have a harder time, you know, climaxing. Is there any anything they can do? Is it just our anatomy? Is it just um, hormones? Yeah. For women to orgasm, it takes a lot more prep and foreplay. Mm. Um, these things that you don't tend to see in mainstream porn. So my theory is a lot of men don't know that they need to be doing a lot of foreplay, like a lot more, yeah. not yeah. like five minutes. Um, in terms of like act, just actual anatomy and science, a woman's body can't be aroused and prepped in five minutes. <laughs> yeah, like yeah. we won't get wet and the clitoris won't be, you know, hard and bigger. That's because the clitoris is the penis. So we do get an erect, like women get erections, right? right. Their clit becomes bigger and harder. And that's when all the blood rushes there. And then slowly after that, you get wetter and wetter. So mm -hmm. it takes time to get there. It takes a lot more playing with the erogenous zone to get there. So right. my tip for men that want to help women climax or orgasm is to play with her erogenous zones more. Mm. And that could be a lot more kissing, um, kissing or licking behind the ears or on the ears, uh, kissing, licking behind the neck, massaging her breasts, playing with her nipples, um, massage, massage her butt. Um, you can even, you know, 
start by like fingering her first. I'm a fan mm -hmm. of fingering. I don't know about you. Do you like fingering? Absolutely. Absolutely. Like anywhere. Fan. And, 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 and not even fingering, like just, you know, on the top, like, yeah, play with a clip. To, yeah. You don't have to go crazy. It's like sand, you know, careful. <laughs> like it's very sensitive down there. Um, as I'm like doing it, but it's, you know, if you're like a guitar player, you might want to put some, put some lotion, put some lube exactly. on or something. Oh, lube but, is great. I'm a big fan of lube. Yeah. No the lube game. Cause yes, I think I, that there's a lot of shame for women because women are like, oh, I have to be able to get so wet or else mm -hmm. I'm not sexy. Girl, you're fine. Like use lube. Lube is amazing. Right. It's a trick. It just sometimes like tricks you, tricks your brain just to yeah. like get you. Cause sometimes, right. When you, a lot of time, well, when I was in a relationship or long-term relationship, sometimes you think like, Oh, I'm so tired. I'm not in the mood. But then once you start doing it, you're like, Oh, okay. You know, it's like working out. I'm at the gym now. I don't really want to be here, but like, Oh, I feel so good after, you know, there's a, yeah. sometimes there's just an element of us where men it's like, Oh, we, you know, every time they feel great after, but I think it's just for men. Don't take it so personally you know, work with her, get her there. Um, I don't know if there's any other suggestions or we can move on to the next topic. No, 100%. I want to confirm that. You, there, Dr. Lori Broder from uh, University of British Columbia does a lot of research in that. And she says, arousal comes before desire. Sometimes mm. you just kind of jump in there and allow yourself to get aroused. Then the desire of wanting sex comes after. Yes. So, That's yeah. huge with women. Um, okay. So another thing that my guys deal with is, is ED. So I have a large audience that is in that age range where they're starting to experience, you know, these types of issues. There's no shame in it. You know, I think it's just important to know that they, it's important to take action. So if you can have any, any tips for them or advice when you're dealing with that or what you tell them to do, that'd be great. Of course. A uh, great question. ED affects one in three men. So if you're listening, you've had it, you're completely normal. Mm -hmm. um, there are three things to consider when it comes to ED and treatments. Uh, the first thing is, are you exercising enough? Mm -hmm. Because exercising allow the pe the blood to go to your penis. And the thing about ED or erectile dysfunction is the penis doesn't um, erect because there isn't enough blood flow. Right. So are you exercising enough would be my first question because exercise allows your blood flow to go to your penis. Hmm. Number two, uh, I would think about, do you have like certain sexual triggers that are like sexual shame or maybe when you were younger, you were molested, you were, you know, sexually abused. Like are there certain sexual trauma that you should be working on with a therapist in order to get over that hump? Because mm -hmm. a lot of ED is not physical, it's psychological. Mm -hmm. So uh, kind of do some reflection, self-reflection to think, what, is there like something that is a trigger, that's a trauma in the past that you, you should work on um, with a therapist and get started in that process? It's never too late. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the third thing I want you to consider is there are also foods that you can eat and supplements that you can take that are natural that can be good in helping that blood flow and the erection to come back. And mm -hmm. some of these, food, these foods are like watermelon, um, celery, beets. Uh, there's also pineapple. Um, mm -hmm. There's also a lot of supplements out there now that – do a mix of like ashwagandha and maca. Mm -hmm. uh, both of these items have a, 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 like experimental data to show that it works in men. Mm -hmm. So I would say look into um, one brand that I like is Mate uh, because he's in LA and he's my friend. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but there's also other brands that you can look up like ashwagandha and maca tend to be like a good combination of um, – supplements that help with erections. Yeah. I'm a big proponent of men going to the doctor because I lost my dad when he was 52 from Oof. a cardiac event. Yeah. I mean, I woke up, he went, he went, he was at the gym when it happened. How ironic oh is God. that? Which happens a lot. Apparently I, I wasn't, I didn't know that until 
you know, I started doing the research, but, you know, something happened. It was, a, it was, it was an aneurysm or a heart attack. And he hadn't gone, my mom shared with me that like he had not gone to the doctor in probably a decade. You know, he was, a, he was a strong, oh, that's a long time, a long time. I mean, he was, he, but, but when I talked to a lot of men and I asked them like, when's the last time you had a physical, when is the last time you got your blood work and your cholesterol taken? you'd be surprised that a lot of them haven't gone. Mm -hmm. So it's just really important. I can't stress that enough because that tells you so much about, you know, your physical health, your heart health. If you're, you know, if your penis isn't working, then, the, you know, there's, there is blockage or there's, yeah. blood, flow, there's blood flow issue. If that's, like you said, that's one of the issues. Mm -hmm. So I, I appreciate that. I couldn't, I couldn't agree with you more. And then there's no shame in it. Like there's, no you know, Viagra and Cialis and all these drugs work amazingly mm -hmm. well. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, do, there, do you find that partners keep that secret from their, their partners, from their female mm -hmm. partners, or do, are they open about it? Is there any shame around it? Uh, I think there's definitely shame in men taking Viagra Cialis because mm -hmm. again, like a lot of their masculine identity is attached to whether or not their penis is work. Right. And when they quote unquote, don't work, then it becomes this insecurity issue. It affects their self-esteem and having to take something to help with that affects their self-esteem. So a lot of them actually hide it from their partner or if they were going on a date. I actually, my one of my best friends went on a date with a guy that took Cialis. So they were watching a movie and his dick was hard. And <laughs> she's like, are you okay? And he's like, he was so shy. And he was like, I'm so sorry. I got to tell you something. I actually took a Cialis because I thought we were going to like have sex with like they started watching a movie and it was really long <laughs> and his dick was just hard. Like it was up, You have to up. time it. You have to time it correctly. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And there's really no shame in having this kind of help, pharmaceutical help once a while. I definitely think there, um, it can be harmful if you rely it for the rest of your life. Because I know a, a, a man, I would say a boy, but a man who's 22 years old and is taking Cialis daily, mm. like when, she, when he has sex. Yeah, that's tough. I mean, <laughs> you're going to be alive another 50 years and take Cialis every single time you have sex. That's, I think, is problematic. That that would that would lead me to believe that that's more of a men, like, a mental issue, yeah. yeah. At that young that yeah. young age, yeah. yeah. But once in a while is fine. I actually told my one of my clients who was going to his sex party for the first time. I was like, if you're too concerned, just take the Alice. Then you get more confidence in that part, and then you're not distracted in like having a conversation with an, a pretty girl. Right, right. So uh, since we're talking about penises, we might as well just keep going. <laughs> um, uh, now, it does, again, something that guys ask me all the time about size. Does size matter? What are your thoughts? Well, I think when people ask that, uh, I wonder if they think like, do they have, they have a micro penis and does it matter? Right. Uh, I'm going to be honest here. Uh, mm -hmm. I know that a lot of men, and there's like studies on perception of penises, I know that a lot of people struggle when they do have a micro penis. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm not going to lie and say it's the motion of the ocean. <laughs> right. It's true if you have like three or four, four inches and you think you're small, like motion of the ocean, bro. Like in that case, you don't have a micro penis. You're fine. But if yeah. your dick is like one inch or like two inches and it, you know, is very skinny and it's by medical term, a micro penis, then yeah, there is struggle. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, overcoming that first perception of it is very important rather than like patching it with like, no, it's the motion of the ocean, right? Mm -hmm. Like if you have a micro penis, number one, know that, you know, there is actually surgery. <laughs> There's a, I've seen some of those. Yeah. I've actually watched like the implants and what right, they can do right. in that start. case. Like, I'm not a medical doctor, so talk to your medical doctor to see if that's the right option for you. I, I know that there are men that do that, so it is definitely an option. So surgical right. option is one of them. Another one is to, you know, get over the fact that you have a micro penis and work on your other skills. Are you good at eating her out? Are you good at fingering? Like she squirts every time you finger. You know, there are so many other skills that like in, in sexual competence rather than penis in vagina pumping. 
Right. And there's the to- I mean, there's toys. There's so many things there's that so we can, you can so do. Things. Yeah. I think it's such a big thing. And I don't think, I think guys make it up. <laughs> but like in their head, they think that you need to be so much bigger, maybe thanks to porn. I mean, maybe they, mm. maybe they think that, but I think I just- if your erection is four inches, which is lower than American average, um, okay. I think it's fine. Okay. Yeah. yeah. In that case, I think it's o- like motion of the ocean. Right. Because explain a little bit of the female anatomy. <laughs> like I'm like using the hand signals. So we, yeah. If you, can't, if you can't see me, it's on the podcast. I'm trying to use hand signals. Like the the vagina really two inches in, right? Is that kind of that squishy, spongy? And there's, mm-hmm. you know, I've heard some different things about this, whether that you know, people say G spot is a G spot orgasm, like really a G spot, or is that area more just the clit, like pushing up against the inside? I haven't really gotten a good answer on this. It's the G zone. It's the G zone, but like, yeah. what? what is that? Is it skin? Is it the mm-hmm. like, what is explain that from an like anatomical perspective? Yeah. So the G zone is about a couple of inches inside the the vagina, usually on top of the vaginal canal because it is the back end of the clit. So Mm. if the clit is here, here's your G zone. It's Mm. on the inside and it's right under the clit because again, the clitoral network is huge. There's that little tip, but then like under it, it's a huge network. And a part of it is in the vaginal canal and is the G zone. So we don't say spot because spot is one tiny thing when in fact, it's like that whole zone and you want to rub it and you don't play with it. So if you're thinking about like giving her an orgasm through fingering, that's where you want to finger. Right. Yeah. Cause I think that again, they th- back to penis size, they're thinking that like penetration and sometimes, you know, it hurts. I'm like, that's my uterus. Don't, <laughs> don't yeah. pound so hard. Like that's not what does it. And I, again, I think it's this misconception that like the, the harder I pound and there, and there's some people that love that. There's some women mm. that love that. I have endometriosis, so mm. I particularly don't, right? Like, no, it's, and it hurts for real. It's <laughs> painful. It's painful. So like focus on, yeah, focus on that, that particular part. And like you said, I love that motion, motion of the ocean. <laughs> um, so as far as, you know, guys who are dating, you said you see married couples and, and we'll start to wrap it up. Cause I know we're, we're getting there. These are such juicy questions though. Yeah. I'm yeah. loving all of it. So as far as sexual escalation and moving from, you know, okay, like we're gone, we've gone on one date. I mean, your, your fiance was very confident in who <laughs> he was working with. So I respect, <laughs> like respect. Um, but for men who, you know, are trying to kind of take things the way, you know, maybe two or three, four dates, how, what, what's kind of an appropriate, like sexual escalation with a woman where the woman feels you know, comfortable and is kind of going along with it. And what's, what gives a guy like his best chances? Yeah. So I like to say in, in my own terms that you need to create erotic opportunities. Oh, yes. And these erotic opportunities are easier in person. So when you're on a date, you know, uh, creating erotic opportunities through uh, prolonged eye contact, There's research that shows when you break eye contact, it shows disinterest. So if you break eye contact a lot, she probably thinks, eh, he's not that into me. Eh, I don't really like him. I don't really trust him. Mm. And trust is very important to build. Like the first thing you want to build is trust. So uh, prolong eye contact. That's like a little bit more suggestive right? Like, Ooh, I'm into you. Or like, you know, throw it through your eyes and it takes practice. I'm not going to lie. Dating Mm -hmm. is a competence. Like you, it really is. Yeah. You become better through experience. So, uh, number one, the first way to create erotic opportunities is eye contact. The second way is touch. Um, because haptics, there's a whole research on haptics, which is the, the study of touch. Uh, it shows that when there's touch, it creates this different side of eroticism that a friendship doesn't have. So if you want to don't want to get friend zone, you want to start touching sooner yes. rather than later. And I'm not saying touch her pussy. I'm saying touch her hand, like hold hand. Uh, so if you're on a first date and it's going well, it's been hour and a half, you're a glass of wine in, ask her, can I hold your hand? 
Hmm. and start mm-hmm. holding her hand because this hand holding it can be very suggestive it er- it creates erotic opportunity right i i went on a new year's date with a very Ooh. very great gentleman very sweet and what i noticed immediately he did something that just kind of just triggered me to think wow okay you know you again you go from you're friendly, you're someone that's sitting across the table from me to, as we were walking, we, we kind of, we went to dinner. And then of course we were kind of going bar hopping. And as I was walking across the street, across the crosswalk, he put his hand on the, the small of my back and like mm. ushered me across the crosswalk. And it was like, Oh, okay. You know, it's not hot. only hot, like it was you know, protective, um, you know, just, just feeling that hand in the back there. It was yes. And, 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 and like, you know, he's not a eight, he's not a nine. He, he, you know, he, you don't have to be any of those things. Like men just get in their head, like, Oh, if she's attracted to me, then it's okay to touch her. It's like, well, if she doesn't it welcome the advance. That's fine. But it's still, you got to try, you got to do you something. Mm-hmm. And if she swats you down and says, then fine, like give it up and just move on, you know, yeah. just keep, keep moving. I um, think you brought up a really good point being okay with rejections. Yeah. It's so important to go through life. Like yes. if you take it, rejections very harshly, that's not doing yourself any justice because there's rejections everywhere. Everywhere. And they everywhere. Happen, they happen for women too. It's oh, not yeah. like it's not like I'm swatting a hundred. There's people that I just don't connect with and I mm-hmm. and I won't hear from them. And you and I'm sure when you were dating too, you're like, okay, yeah. moving Same. on. Yeah. yeah. And you that's just, fine. Yeah. yeah. It's not, it's not a, your it's not an issue. Yeah. So you brought up a really good point about being able to like be brave, be confident mm-hmm. and be okay with rejections. I love that. So create, create erotic opportunities, erotic very important. opportunities yeah. and, and move so that she can move you from friend zone friend, to yeah. potentially sex zone. <laughs> yeah. Erotic zone. You want to be in the erotic zone, baby. <laughs> oh my gosh. You're uh, amazing. Um, well, this was awesome. I would say, Let's see if I had uh, one other question. Um, Any other things that you have as far as, oh, I do want to ask this question because I thought it was a really thoughtful question from one of my viewers and then we can end there. As far as STDs and the social stigmas that come with them, you know, uh, herpes and, you know, getting tested for STDs, talking about it, it's tough, right? Like that's a really tough conversation. So I don't know if you have any advice, um, as far as just bringing it up and, and feeling it out and talking about it with the partner? Mm-hmm. How soon do you bring it up? Do you, you know, when? I think it's so important to bring it up early in dating because it's only worse if you've dated a long time and only share it because all the trust you've built will be like Destroyed. collapsed. Yeah, it will collapse. Um, so it's important to share it up front. I mean, it's unfortunate that it's something that you're like, you have to do, but it is something you, you have to do is to share it up front. And when you share it, it's like, hey, I just want to be honest with you. Um, or, hey, I want to be transparent with you. Mm-hmm. Here's what happened to me. And here's what I have. And here's... Uh, like when we can have sex, like, you know, uh, if I don't have breakouts, it's totally safe to have sex. I have condoms. I'm sure you have condoms, you know, it's going to be fine. So practicing saying these things at home is important because you want to be able to deliver it in a confident way that Mm -hmm. it's okay. Right. Um, another thing that I want to say too, because people are like, Oh, it's so hard to navigate the dating world when you have STDs. Like there is a website called positive singles. Mm. There are lots of attractive people on there that, you know, have something, um, herpes, HPV, whatever, uh, that you can date and they're like-minded people. They're on the same page as you. They don't want the social stigma from the, you know, mainstream dating world. So that could be an easy uh, solution to, you know, STD and dating. That's a really great suggestion. And I think a lot of people, I think more people have these things than we really oh, talk yeah. about. I think it's a yeah. way, I mean, everybody has HPV pretty much. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's everybody a, has HPV. <laughs> yeah. I just want people to understand that, look, shit happens. And if you're, you know, unless you're sleeping with one person and you're, you know, Christian and that's what you've decided to do, 
you know, if you have that, this just shit happens. Yeah. It's the consequence of, of having sex. And that's something that people have to deal with. Yeah. And if you look at statistics, it's so many people. So let's not shame them. Let's just talk right. about solutions. Right. Well, thank you so much. You jumped on so quick. I'm just starting out this podcast. So you're gonna actually going to be my first episode on my public podcast. I have a private one what? that's paid. So I'm, I'm like launching with a bang. Oh, <laughs> I'm so excited. Wow. I'm glad you didn't tell me at the beginning. I feel so much more pressure. No, this is, <laughs> this is just a conversation. Oh, that yeah. was so great. Congratulations. Thank you. So tell us, um, you know, what you have planned, where they can, where my viewers can find you. Do you have a YouTube or is it just right now, Instagram and TikTok? And then if you have a book or anything that you're writing, Yes. So I have actually two exciting projects coming up. One of them is a TV project. Yay. So I have to be hush hush for now, but uh, later in the year, you'll see me on TV. Um, the second one is a book that I'm writing right now. It won't come out until next year. It's called Sex That Doesn't Suck. Um, <laughs> and it's just wait. a fun way to approach sex. It's my way of approaching sex. Uh, and then you can find me on lovebites.co. That's my website, L-U-V-B-I-T-E-S dot C-O. Uh, I'm on, I'm on everything. I'm on uh, Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, and YouTube. Awesome. Uh, I'm okay. actually going to start a YouTube live Q&A show called oh. In Bed with Dr. Tara. Oh my gosh. Um, Please. Where you can ask sex questions and I answer them. Uh, so I'm really excited about that. Oh my gosh. I can't wait. You'll have to let me know when that is and I'll share it with, with my viewers as well. So, well, congratulations. Good luck. I know, uh, the wedding is, that's a big stressor. So hopefully you have some time to relax before you'll be having your champagne with the, with all of your friends and family. So thank you so much. And I will, I will leave all of your links in my, in the show description and in the notes. So thank you so thank much. Thank you, Sarah.